Hey guys, Coach Barreline again, uh, getting ready to give you a second installment of your uh, video lesson. Uh, today we'll be talking about uh, Europe's uh, or Europe barreling into war, and, and actually the, the the Second World War starting. You know, last last uh, session we talked about the the aggression of different uh, dictators, and we talked specifically about Hitler's uh, moves to. Uh, annex Austria or add Austria and then he invaded Czechoslovakia and took over Sudetenland and there was no uh, action by the Allies to do anything to stop him uh, so after Czechoslovakia they kind of said you know this is it Neville Chamberlain using the policy of appeasement says you know no more and we're going to talk about what happens uh, when Hitler takes the next step um, we're going to talk about uh, Germany uh, uh, Turning and for, turning and invading Poland and triggering the start of World War II. Our reading focus questions are: How did Germany's actions in 1939 trigger the start of World War II? Where German forces turned after overrunning Poland, and then what developments increased tension between the United States and Japan and, and East Asia? In Japan, uh, in East Asia. All right. So uh, some of the important, some one of the more important figures that we need to discuss is Neville Chamberlain. And Chamberlain was the Prime Minister of Great Britain at the time, and he believed that a policy, policy of appeasement had prevented the outbreak of the war. He says, he goes home and says that he has uh, secured peace in our time. Now, uh, he had opponents in Great Britain. Winston Churchill, for instance, believed that the Nazi aggression was dangerous and that the Great Britain should have acted to stop it stop it cold but uh, you know most of Britain supported Chamberlain he was hailed as a returning hero unfortunately it turns out that Churchill is correct you know Hitler uh, uh, took his his part of Czechoslovakia but he continues to try to gain uh, more land and and the next place the attack is going to be Poland all right, so uh, again, 1939, Czechoslovakia, Hitler sends troops in uh, the rest of Czechoslovakia. You remember last time he had been uh, allowed to take the Sudetenland, but he went ahead and just took the rest of Czechoslovakia. Finally, Chamberlain realizes that Hitler can't be trusted and that appeasement had failed. Uh, so he loses credibility. It's going to lead to Churchill being uh, the new prime minister in, in England. Uh, Germany uh, established a pact with Italy. It's known as the Rome-Berlin Axis, all right, and that's where we get the term the Axis powers. And they also established a non-aggression treaty with the Soviet Union. And what the, the reason for this was Hitler knew all along that he wanted to expand uh, further east into Eastern Europe, and he wanted to attack France. And he knew that if, to do that expansion, he would have to keep the Soviet Union on the sideline because he wanted to avoid for as long as he could the two-front war that uh, Germany had faced in World War One. So Stalin agrees not to stop Hitler's expansion. Hitler agrees not to attack Stalin. And Stalin also gets some, uh, some uh, or Hitler also makes some promises to Stalin about being, being able to control parts of Eastern Europe. Uh, many in Europe were sh shocked by this pact because they counted on the Soviet Union acting as a check against Hitler's aggression. So on September 1st in 1939, Hitler invaded Poland. And they used a, uh, military, that, a military tactic that's new, and he calls it the Blitzkrieg, uh, or Lightning War. And anyway, so, uh, yeah, that's uh, incorrect spelling of lightning. But anyway, the Lightning War had to do with uh, very, very fast-paced, very hard-hitting uh, types of attacks that had never been seen before uh, in, in warfare. Poland fights back, but they just don't have the power to stand up against the German army. And by the end of the month, Poland was in uh, German hands. Uh, so uh, now having Poland taken control, uh, you know, Germany begins to turn westward. And after the invasion of Poland, Great Britain and France do declare war on Germany, and they become known as, you know, what we call the Allies. The Allies didn't attack Germany. They uh, decided to wait for Germany to make its next, next move. And they believed that Germany would try to invade France, and they wouldn't be able to get through the Maginot line of defenses on the French and German border. So they thought that Germany would weaken itself, and then they would be able to, to attack Germany and, and, and it, it'd be weak enough that they could defeat pretty easily. 
But Germany makes plans to bypass the Maginot Line. So they go through the Ardennes Forest, which uh, if you remember back in World War I, Ardennes was an, an important uh, battle at that time. But the rugged terrain and the, the dense forest basically meant the French kind of thought that an army can't go through there. So they concentrated their defenses on the Maginot Line. And Hitler, of course, knew this, so he said, you know, we're not going to attack the Maginot Line, that's where all their soldiers are. So we're going to go through this forest, and of course, uh, it's very lightly defended, and they're able to, to make short work of, of the defenders there. All right, so just a quick uh, timeline here. April 1940, Hitler invaded uh, Denmark and Norway first. And this was in order to uh, improve G uh, Germany's access to the Atlantic Ocean and, and make them more able to put forth their uh, their uh, naval powers. Uh, a month later in May, Germany finally invaded France. Uh, they take kind of the same route they did in World War I. They conquered the Netherlands and Belgium first and uh, those, those the Belgian, British, and French troops there are unable to stop the Germans. And the Germans uh, cornered hundreds of thousands of troops and we're getting ready to really destroy the entire, uh, the entire British French armies. But the British were able to, uh, were able to, were able to uh, get a lot of their troops out at Dunkirk, and they use uh, they use military vessels, fishing boats, civilian yachts, all sorts of things to be able to get these troops out. And it's important because they're able to maintain some form of military force moving forward. Uh, meanwhile, German, Germany moves on through France and attacks through the Ardennes, making the Maginot Line uh, pointless pretty much. Uh, less than a month later, France surrendered to Germany and Italy, and uh, basically uh, Germany occupies, uh, occupies France. Now, much of France, known as Vichy France, uh, was unoccupied, but still uh, basically uh, technically under the control of Germany because uh, you know they, they controlled the capital in Paris. But the Vichy France is going to become important because it, it becomes the place where France and Great Britain are going to organize the resistance against German occupation. All right, and in East Asia, you have Japan, and uh, it's getting increasingly... Uh, increasingly aggressive. So, uh, 1934, uh, they way back in the 30s, they had begun expanding their naval forces and really becoming more and more militarized. 1936, they had signed an anti-communism pact with Germany. So, the anti-communism pact to counter the Soviet Union between Japan and Germany, combined with the Rome-Berlin axis of Italy and Germany, creates what we know as the axis powers with uh, with uh, Germany. Uh, Italy and uh, Japan. 1937, they invaded China, uh, Manchuria first, uh, but uh, basically they're going to control China and Southeast Asia uh, for the late 30s. And in 1940, they finally formed the, mil the full military alliance with Germany and Italy, and they're going to become known as the Axis powers. All right, 1941, Japan moves to expand its power in East Asia and takes control of French Indochina, which today we would call Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, that area. Um, and this threatens American interests. So President Roosevelt you know, tries to talk with General Tojo, who was the Minister of War and really the power uh, behind the throne, so to speak, in Japan. Uh, but uh, compromise was, was already passed. So now we're going to get into the U.S. entering the war. You know, we, uh, we know that uh, uh, Japan knew that the United States was a threat, and they were trying to knock them out before, knock the United States out before they had a chance to stop their aggression. So there was a strong isolationist feeling in the United States. Uh, people wanted to stay out of it. They'd been kind of burned by, by the war and wanted to, to move along uh, and, and not get involved in European conflict. So we're talking about the commitment to isolationism, how Roosevelt still managed to try to help the Allies even though people were isolationists, what the U.S. did prepare for the war, and the cause and effects of the Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor. 
All right, so uh, isolationists were not all pacifists. They weren't all people that uh, abhorred all war, but they wanted to preserve America's freedom to choose when and where they would act. Uh, many Americans questioned the costly victory in World War I. You know, the, Anti -League, the League of Nations was not well thought of in the United States, and we hadn't even signed or we hadn't even approved of the uh, Treaty of Versailles. So many Americans felt like you know, they didn't want the League to drag the U.S. into, into future wars. Roosevelt was not an isolationist, but he was focused, as many other countries were, on the Great Depression and trying to solve those problems. Congress passed the Isolationist Act, known as Neutrality Act, in 1935. We'll talk about Roosevelt to kind of find some ways around that, though. All right, so isolationism, you have the Neutrality Act, which prohibits the sale of arms or making loans to warring countries. Roosevelt needed the support of isolationists, so he kind of had to go along with them because he wanted to get his New Deal programs instituted. Uh, U.S. didn't officially intervene in the Spanish Civil War, although many Americans did fight uh, in the war. And they didn't uh, object to the Japanese invasion of China either. However, uh, Roosevelt uh, did take some actions. When Italy invaded Opia, uh, Ethiopia back in uh, 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 1935, Roosevelt kind of uh, stopped arms sales to both countries, which really only hurt Italy because Ethiopia didn't have a lot of, didn't buy a lot of weapons from the United States anyway. But Roosevelt didn't want to remain neutral. And he began to speak out against neutrality with uh, the quarantine speech. And the quarantine speech, you know, he basically talked, you know, we have to, we have to isolate these countries that are, that are causing this aggression. So Roosevelt asked Congress for money to build a new naval, new naval vessels, and they did approve. But part of it was sold as a job-creating uh, thing during the Great Depression, a job-creating act. Uh, they also changed neutrality laws to, to a new policy called cash and carry. So countries at war could buy American goods if they paid cash and pick the goods up. So we couldn't sh we couldn't take credit or ship them to the countries, but it was a way for us to aid the allies. Uh, Roosevelt urged a policy called all aid short of war. For instance, he traded 50 warships to the British for uh, military bases that the United States could use. So uh, isolationists opposed the deal, but it was a way to get around the Neutrality Act, more or less. All right, so uh, Roosevelt uh, basically uh, had won another term, the first and only president to serve three terms, and he believed that you know his, his experience was important. So he got Congress to pass the Lend-Lease Act, which allowed the nation to send weapons to Great Britain only. And this was important. And then in 1941, Roosevelt and Churchill, who was the uh, Prime Minister of Great Britain at the time, agreed to sign the Atlantic Charter. And this document said that basically the United States and Britain were, were united in opposing Hitler and his allies. Uh, despite German U-boats attacks, U.S. ships... Uh, continue or isolationists continued to uh, oppose entry into the war, even though U.S. ships delivering goods to Great Britain were under attack from German submarines. The event, obviously, that finally breaks us out of out of uh, isolationism is the attack on Pearl Harbor, and this was caused by the fact that Japan uh, and the United States have been in conflict a conflict over French Indochina, and Japan knew that uh, you know, they were going to have to fight the U.S. if they wanted to maintain control in Asia. Now, of course, the impact is that Americans are angry after the attack. Uh, you have lots of fear, lots of anger, and basically this turned the balance against the isolationists. And, of course, Roosevelt made his famous day, uh, day they'll live in infamy speech and, and uh, the Congress declared war on Japan. And then Germany and Italy declared war on the United States. So now you have all the different pieces. Uh, so the attack on Pearl Harbor was a, a huge success for the Japanese. They destroyed much of uh, the American fleet. But it, we were lucky because, uh, you know, while eight battleships, all the battleships were sunk, uh, the Americans were able to uh, 
uh, by luck, uh, maintain their aircraft carriers that were out on maneuver. So it allowed the United States to still be able to project some naval power in the Pacific until more ships could could be produced. So while while the the attack was devastating for naval power, uh, there is one piece of luck that's going to allow the U.S. to continue to compete.